where do drug formulators come up with dosing regimens for each particular drug? In this video, we're going to remind you of the origin of a loading dose and then discuss in detail how a maintenance dosing regimen is also developed. As you may have already guessed, they arise primarily from pharmacokinetic parameters and a knowledge of what a therapeutic target concentration might be based upon what we call pharmacodynamic information, that is the action of the drug. With some simple illustrations and models, we will hopefully make it easier for you to understand whether you're learning these concepts for the first time or are interested in a review. Let's start by saying that most drug actions require that therapeutic concentrations of a drug are reached at the target site for a certain period of time, whatever they might be. And those concentrations at the target site are going to be in a steady state with the plasma drug concentrations. Let's take a look at the time versus concentration curve for a single oral dose of a drug. As you can see in this graph, if we know the therapeutic concentration range in plasma, all that we need to do is to maintain those concentrations within that range for the necessary time to achieve whatever effect we desire to attain. In this case, a single dose of a drug was given by an extravascular route, orally, and the duration of action will last as long as the drug is within that therapeutic range. For drugs with a very short half-life, the safest and most reliable administration route may be by constant rate infusion, or CRI, which we described in detail in a previous video. In summary, the rate of the infusion, called Q here, is equal to the clearance of the drug times the target concentration. If you notice, when we start giving the maintenance dose, it will take around four half-lives for that drug to reach 94% of the steady state levels within the range that we're aiming for. And in situations like severe infections or very painful conditions, you may not want to take the luxury of waiting that long, meaning that we want therapeutic concentrations right away. And that's when a loading dose comes into play. You might remember that a loading dose is a single dosage that targets the ideal concentration. With this brief review of basic pharmacokinetic principles and concepts, let's build on our understanding. In our video summarizing pharmacokinetics, we focused on the analogy of a one compartment model being like a bucket with a hole in it. We also briefly discussed the two compartment model which helps us think about drug exchanging between the central compartment and a peripheral compartment that sometimes is discussed as representing tissues. So we can take a look at this phenomenon as two buckets exchanging water while the faucet which represents drug administration administers water or drug into one of them. As you can see, the drug can pass between the two compartments, but we only can measure drug concentration within the central compartment, which includes the vascular compartment. And hopefully you recall that when we're dealing with a two compartment model and we plot the logarithm of the drug concentration versus time, we get a plot that looks like this. And so you can see that early in the pharmacokinetic curve, we have a phase that is more rapid decline associated with distribution of the drug into that peripheral compartment. So while a two compartment model better fits the behavior of most drugs, the assumptions of a one compartment model, that is that there's immediate distribution of a drug, are adequate for most clinical purposes. In fact, we can see this, how close this can be, when we extrapolate the elimination curve back to time zero. And that would be the same point that we'd use the time zero concentration to calculate the volume of distribution, now in this case, of the central compartment. Let's turn our attention to the calculated clearance, which is not typically provided in most formularies. A simple way to calculate it is to multiply the volume of distribution by the elimination constant, which is the fraction of the drug eliminated in a given time, in that for most drugs which follow first-order kinetics, we can calculate by dividing by the natural logarithm of 2, or 0 0.693, by the half-life of the drug. The maintenance dose 
would be the dosage in milligrams per kilogram body weight given at each interval, and that will equal the clearance in liters per kilogram per hour times the de desired steady state concentrations in plasma. If the drug was given by any route other than IV, we would have to account for the bioavailability, or F, which is the fraction of drug that is absorbed and ultimately reaches the blood to be distributed throughout the body. Returning to dosing regimens, if we seek rapid achievement of a given concentration and want to maintain that concentration, we can add a loading dose to a constant rate of infusion, or CRI, designed to maintain the same concentration. Let's take a look. This graph was calculated from a two-compartment model of a drug with a half-life of four hours. The early dip is due to distribution of the IV bolus dose, loading dose that is, uh, before the constant rate of infusion uh, fully comes into play. But you can see essentially we're creating a square wave where the loading dose rapidly achieves the desired concentration and the constant rate of infusion maintains it. Let's now move to the intermittent dosing regimens, where the rate of administration depends on the amount of fluctuation in drug concentration that can occur during a dosing interval, which in turn is determined by the relationship between the half-life of the drug and the dosing interval, which we'll call tau. If a drug is administered at an interval much longer than its half-life, that is tau is much greater than the half-life, as we see in the following plot. As you can see, most of the drug will be eliminated during each dosing interval and the maintenance and loading dose will be almost identical. This is okay if the drug does not fall below subtherapeutic concentrations at C-min or rise above toxic levels at C-max. Or in this case, shown of the antimicrobial drug genomycin, where the pharmacodynamics, that is the action, is prolonged well beyond the time suggested by the drug concentration in the plasma. In fact, we give genomycin a single dose every 24 hours, despite the fact that its half-life is two hours. Not only is this protocol efficacious for treating certain bacteria, but it also tends to protect uh, the kidney from the nephrotoxic effects of genomycin. Let's take a look at the other extreme of dosing. When a drug action depends upon a maintenance of a near constant concentration, such as with cardiac drugs, certain antimicrobials, or antiepileptic drugs, the more appropriate adjustment may be to decrease the dosing interval. Let's take a look at an example of the orally administered digoxin given every 12 hours, despite the fact that the median half-life in dogs is about 30 hours. As you can see, ideally we want the fluctuations of the plasma drug concentration to fall within the target or the therapeutic range. And we assume that within that range, the drug will be effective for its chosen purpose. For example, treating an infection or helping the heart pump better. Now, if that drug has a small therapeutic margin, as digoxin does, it will be important that the maximum concentration reached between intervals does not exceed levels that may be toxic. And similarly, we may not want them to fall below a minimum effective level between intervals. In this simulation, with frequent dosing, that is tau, is small relative to the half-life, you can see how this approach to dosing can achieve a result similar to that of a constant rate infusion. Drugs with a long half-life compared with the dosing interval tau will accumulate with each dose until a steady state equilibrium is reached, such that the amount of drug eliminated during each dosing interval is equivalent to the amount of drug administered during that interval. The accumulation ratio describes the magnitude of increase of either the C-max concentration max or C-min at steady state compared with the first dose. The longer the half-life compared with the dosing interval, the greater the accumulation ratio. Many times all that is provided to us by a drug formula is the half-life and the maintenance dosage but we can easily calculate a loading dose from those two values. Let's now take a look at a plot where a drug is administered 
at an interval that's equivalent to its half-life, in this case, eight hours. In this simulation, we can see that the administration of a maintenance dose of 100 milligram per kilogram will eventually lead to the accumulation of the concentration to twice of what it was after the original loading dose. You can see that Cmax is about twice what it is at steady state than it was after the first dose. So in this case, the accumulation factor from the first dose until it reaches a steady state is two. And that would be what you need to have to multiply the maintenance dose to calculate the loading dose. Another way of calculating the accumulation factor is to calculate the fraction that remains in plasma after each time interval, which we're going to arbitrarily call R. In this case, R would be the Cmin divided by Cmax, where Cmin is the minimum concentration at the end of the interval divided by Cmax, which is the maximum concentration reached between intervals. In this case, we lose 50% of the drug concentration between intervals because we're administering it at the half-life. We could also calculate R by applying the formula which multiplies the elimination constant and then taking the exponential of the resulting value. Finally, when we have calculated R, it is easy to calculate the accumulation factor by simply dividing 1 by 1 minus r. As you can see, again, we attain the value of 2 for this particular example. In summary, the maintenance dosage is expressed in milligram per kilogram for a constant time interval and derives from multiplying the clearance of a drug by the desired plasma therapeutic concentrations. This is a major component of any dosing regimen. A loading dose is the first dose that may precede a maintenance dose. When do we need to use a loading dose? A simple rule of thumb would be any time the half-life is much shorter than tau, the interval, the loading dose can be equal to the maintenance dose. Any time half-life is equal to tau, the interval, the loading dose is twice the maintenance dose. And any time the half-life is much greater than tau, the loading dose is much greater than the maintenance dose. So. It is used in situations where the half-life is greater than tau, and depending on whether you continue dosing as a constant rate infusion or at different intervals, the calculations will differ. When followed by a constant rate infusion, a simple way of calculating a loading dose is by multiplying the desired plasma concentration by the volume of distribution. When using intervals, then the loading dose is calculated by multiplying the maintenance dose by the accumulation factor. Let's now put this into practice with an example. Assume that you are presented with a 20 kilogram dog with probable septicemic shock that could be associated with a parvoviral viral infection, indicated by the presence of bloody diarrhea. The antibiotic that you want to administer works at a therapeutic concentration of 20 milligrams per liter in plasma. For this antibiotic, the pharmacokinetic parameters in the formulary tell you that the half-life is 8 hours and the volume of distribution is 1.5 liters per kilogram. So the two questions are, what is the infusion rate in milligrams per hour that you would use for the maintenance constant rate infusion? And what would be the loading dose that should be given as an IV bolus? The solution for the first question is shown here. We first calculate the clearance by multiplying the elimination constant by the volume of distribution. And once we know the clearance, we multiply it by the desired concentration of 20 milligrams per liter to come up with a dosage rate of 2.6 milligram per kilogram per hour. So let's take a look at what that gives us alone. You can see that our calculated constant rate infusion puts us right on the target of 20 milligrams per liter. As you can see, the concentrations rise slowly until the steady state is achieved or at about four half-lives, in this case, 32 hours. Therefore, we need a loading dose that will put you at the 20 milligram per liter mark right away. And after you give the loading dose, you can continue the constant rate infusion of the maintenance dose. So, to answer question two, 
all we need to do for this scenario is to multiply the desired concentration of 20 milligrams per liter by the volume of distribution, which gives us 30 milligrams per kilogram. Of course, if the dosage is expressed as milligrams per kilogram to get the actual dose, we would have to multiply times the animal's body weight of 20 kilograms. So we're giving 600 milligram loading dose and 20 times 2.6 milligram per kilogram per hour or 52 milligrams per hour constant rate infusion. Here's what it looks like. You can see that the result is a more immediate achievement of the desired concentration followed by its maintenance. That is, it creates a square wave effect. So we achieve the concentration we need and we maintain it. Now obviously, if you chose to use an intermittent dosing regimen for the maintenance therapy, instead of a constant rate infusion, you would need to use the formula comparing the dosing interval tau to the half-life to account for the decline in drug concentration between dosages in order to maintain concentrations in the therapeutic range. In summary, we started with the premise that drug actions take place when certain concentrations are reached at a site of action of a drug for a required period of time. Because the concentrations at the site of action are expected to be in steady state with those in plasma, what happens in plasma predicts effects at the site of action. The pharmacokinetic parameters such as volume distribution and clearance are key to our calculations. A general rule of thumb is that because three to five half-lives will be required to reach steady state concentrations with maintenance dosages, sometimes a loading dose is required to attain therapeutic levels from the very first dose. Both the loading dosage and the maintenance dosage and intervals are key pieces of information of a dosing regimen you might find in a drug formulary.